Hi, everybody. Really happy to be able to join you today and talk about this exciting topic, um, which is, of course, our embodied carbon strategy and our roadmap to 2030. Can everyone hear me and see my screen okay? Great. Thank you. Anthony, you got it? Awesome. Well, yeah. Okay. Really excited to talk to you today. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us and this opportunity to, to talk to you today and talk about um, you know, what's happening here in Vancouver and how we can all work together to get there. So um, I just have about 20-ish slides and then hoping to have a good discussion and uh, hopefully be able to answer any questions or um, uh, get some ideas and discussion flow flowing around. So today I'll talk just a brief background on climate emergency action plan, which included our brand new embodied carbon strategy. I'll talk about, briefly about next steps. So where we're going in the next year or so. I'll give you a little sneak peek uh, about what some of those actions could look like, some of the in initial things we've heard so far. Um, and then I'll, I'll hope to kick off a bit of a discussion about how we can help. Um, and also we can, we can talk about any questions you might have for me um, about any of this. So if that sounds good, um, I, I also want to acknowledge, of course, that um, I'm very uh, honored to be able to present on behalf of the city of Vancouver, which sits on the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I'm um, very grateful to be able to, um, for their generosity in hosting us uh, as a city. And also, um, it gives me, uh, I'm very grateful for Indigenous uh, knowledge, wisdom, and perspective um, that I think is very relevant to embodied carbon discussion. Um, the, the understanding and the greater consideration for where things come from, where they go, what our connection is to materials and to our impacts uh, upstream, downstream. I think there's um, a lot we can learn from Indigenous knowledge and wisdom in that area. So I'm very grateful for that as well. Um, so as you can see here, we are, these are the things we're going to cover. And I'm just going to jump right into our Climate Emergency Action Plan. So if you haven't heard of this, um, in 2019, our City Council declared a climate emergency and gave staff 90 days to come back with climate emergency response. Um, we uh, put our heads together, talked to many stakeholders, and came up with uh, six big moves uh, that cover uh, various actions that we can take as a city to address the climate emergency. These uh, moves include uh, targets uh, of, so the first being by 2030, 90% of people will, li will live within an easy walk and roll of their daily needs. Number two, by 2030, two thirds of trips in Vancouver will be by active transportation and transit. Number three, by 2030, 50% of the kilometers driven on Vancouver's roads will be by zero emissions vehicles. Number four, by 2025, all new and replacement heating and hot water systems will be zero emissions. Number five, which is most relevant for us today, by 2030, embodied emissions from new buildings and construction projects will be reduced by 40%. And finally, number six, by 2020, develop uh, negative emissions targets for restoring forests and coastal ecosystems. So that's now become a uh, reporting in 2021. And that's actually an interesting piece that has some tie-ins with our work here on body carbon as well. Um, but as Anthony has um, stressed in presentations in the past, when we get past 2050, we know that uh, global emissions need to go net negative. So what does that mean at a city level? And I think there's some really interesting questions there and connections to our work here. But just looking across these six actions, the first um, actually is being rolled into our Vancouver plan uh, planning process for a new citywide uh, comprehensive plan for the city of Vancouver. Actions two through five or big moves two through five are the core of the climate emergency action plan. And then action six uh, is actually big move six is separate. It will be reported on separately as well. Um, so those are the six big moves and um, our embodied carbon strategy uh, sits with big move five. So low carbon construction, low carbon materials and construction practices. So without further ado, what is our embodied carbon strategy? It is our plan, our strategy to achieve our goal of 40% reduction in embodied carbon by 2030 compared to 2018. So there's a number of components that lay out the strategy. It's more than just what we will do. 
It is um, what are the what are the pieces we need to consider? What are our principles? What is our vision? And um, what are the actions we'll take to get there? Uh, what is the impact? And uh, and what is our implementation plan and things like that? So that's all in the strategy, which I've included a link to at the very end of this presentation. But I'm just going to walk through some of the key pieces so you have an understanding of um, what is in that strategy. So it starts with our vision. Um, you know, if we're successful in the long term, even beyond that initial goal of a 40% reduction, what are we trying to achieve? What does success truly look like in the long term in this area? And I think there's a lot of opportunities to really look at the materiality of buildings overall, draw from some of the best thinking and best practices across the green building world, and recognize some of those, um, those leading uh, thoughts, practices, and ideas that have been out there in the green building world for, for decades already. And um, when we put this all together, we end up with a vision for a healthy, equitable, circular, carbon positive construction. Um, and there's a number of pieces that we have all pulled together that will all be part of achieving this vision. And that ranges from sustainable and equitable, source, equitable sourcing, healthy and transport uh, parent sourcing. So looking at um, what is going into these materials, where they come from, where they end up, who is impacted. Uh, looking at uh, material building reuse and green demolition and salvage. So where do materials, um, are there opportunities for that circular construction economy? Um, where do materials get reused? Where do they go at the end of their life? And can we help close that loop? Um, are there ways that we can plan for low embodied carbon communities from the beginning? So building that right into the, the way we envision our communities, the way we set up our zoning and development bylaw and policies and guidelines and all those things and the way that we think about the way our communities are structured are there low carbon things we can build in up front um, thinking about design of course how can we use less material to begin with or can we design more efficiently and can we design for greater durability uh, greater longer life greater longevity and uh, even disassembly and reuse can we build that in from the beginning when we look at specific materials, um, there can we use uh, low carbon materials like wood and mass timber construction, modular construction, uh, natural materials that are actually carbon storing? Can we use those kinds of materials and products? And of course, those big uh, materials that we use most often um, currently in Vancouver, uh, can we have uh, and source low carbon versions of concrete, low carbon metals, things like that? Um, really tackling where some of those emissions are in today's buildings. And of course, there's looking at all life, sta life cycle stages of uh, the building. So um, it's not just how materials are made or where they go. Um, there are emissions in the transportation process. There are emissions on site. Um, so really, are there ways that we can tackle all of these different life cycle stages? And of course, um, there's a lot of, there's a, these are all part of an ecosystem. So. Uh, how do we create enabling regulations, policies, programs, standards, data, and tools, and of course, knowledge, practice, and networks like this one we have here today that we're so lucky to have. It will take all of these things to achieve that vision, uh, say by 2050, over the long term. Our goal, of course, is 40% by 2030. Uh, that's, uh, that was established in 2019. And we want to get there by 2030 um, compared to a 2018 baseline. So that is the, the more near-term goal that we are aiming for. The strategy also covers a number of basics so that we have a common, uh, we're all on the same page or can be um, getting on the same page when it comes to what is embodied carbon, what are the terms we're using, what are the definitions, um, all of these things. So the, um, the strategy goes through a number of those. It covers um, just some of the basics of, you know, how much how much emissions on average are are upfront versus uh, use stage or end of life, and it starts to lay down the groundwork for where we will focus our actions most and earliest. So, for example, the upfront carbon, you know, in in some cases can be eighty percent of uh, that whole building life cycle carbon, and so that is obviously a place that we want to focus and has been a focus. Um, but of course, that's 80% is 100. There's still emissions elsewhere. And as we reduce those upfront emissions, then those other portions will become a bigger piece of the pie. 
Um, it also talks about you know, the variation within materials. Some materials um, can be um, higher carbon, some materials can be lower carbon. And within a, pro a category like insulation, um, there can be a huge range uh, in the impact of those different materials. It also covers things like, you know, there's different pieces of a building. So the buildings are kind of built up in layers from foundation to structure to finishes and exterior and furniture on the inside. Um, some of which may be excluded from scope, some of which may be included, all of which have different replacement cycles and lifetimes and, and considerations. So um, it's just uh, kind of laying out some of the nuances of uh, and common understandings that we have drawing on many of the, the best practice um, reports and a lot of the great work that's already been done by the World Green Building Council, by the Athena Institute and others. Um, laying that kind of common foundation of knowledge that we can all uh, build off and helps the strategy focus our actions to uh, have the best chance of success and the biggest impact. It also lays out a number of principles. So as we go from vision and goal to actions, um, as we develop specific policy changes or programs to achieve those goals, um, what are the principles that we are hoping to achieve or that we will, will help guide us as we go from idea to action or general to specific? So some of the principles that we laid down in that strategy are urgency. Of course, we're in a climate of urgency and we have to act as such neutrality of materials. So no one material is the whole problem and no one material is the whole solution. It's really gonna take innovation in all materials to get to that vision of a carbon positive construction and or even our goal of 40% reduction by 2030. And so um, it's not as simple as just stop using one material and use another material or um, you know just use more of this one material. Um, there's really opportunities in all material types and um, you know, some really exciting opportunities in, in all material types, I think. And um, it's not just gonna be any one thing or, or any other material necessarily. And it's really gonna depend on the building type. It's really gonna depend on the specifics of your project. So uh, just to, to emphasize where, while there may be some you know, more work to do in one area than another to begin with, we really do think there are amazing opportunities in all, uh, to do with all materials. Uh, healthy materials and buildings. So there's been a lot of work done in this in the past. As we get into the material materiality of buildings, um, not just from a carbon perspective, we can take an overall health um, perspective and understand that we're going to be looking at what materials and uh, products we're using. There's a real opportunity to emphasize healthy materials, non-toxic materials, transparency of materials, uh, and things like that to make um, not just low carbon buildings, but healthier uh, buildings that are non-toxic, that are more reusable, that have all these other benefits as well. Circularity, so can we uh, not just create a linear low carbon building economy, but can we create a more circular low carbon building economy as well? So it's not only low carbon, but using less new materials and more reused materials creating more opportunities in the ways we build and design uh, for material reuse as well. Um, equity and responsibility. So equity has been a huge piece of the Climate Emergency Action Plan. Uh, and in materials uh, and in body carbon, there's an opportunity to take responsibility for the upstream and downstream impacts of our construction. Um, the entire uh, area of embodied carbon as a city traditionally falls outside our area of responsibility. We, we typically, from a carbon perspective, look at scope one and two emissions that are happening um, from our energy use and from our actual territorial emissions. And now we're looking beyond that or recognizing that uh, ecosystems and people are impacted upstream and downstream because of our activities, because of our purchases uh, of materials and because of our, our construction that we need um, to, to build the city that we are building. And so there's an opportunity to take greater responsibility for that and to enhance the equity uh, within our own construction industry here 
but within the wider uh, supply chains upstream and downstream um, of our construction activities. Affordability, we are of course in an affordability crisis in Vancouver as many large cities around the world are facing. Um, so we don't want our changes to adversely impact those that can least afford um, to make changes or to, to have to face increased costs. So um, we understand that and we uh, wanna make sure that that is uh, front and center uh, as part of any changes that we make. And finally, shared knowledge and vision. So we understand that this is only something that we can all achieve together. Um, just changing a regulation is not enough. And at the same time, we all need to be on board. It's going to take everyone's knowledge, everyone's action. And uh, we really want to help build a shared vision of what uh, low carbon and um, better buildings can look like in Vancouver. So the strategy itself uh, lays out four action areas that uh, we call change the rules, which has to do with policy and regulation that we control, change the market, um, more traditionally known as removing barriers and providing incentives, change the culture, so industry capacity building and transformation, and change the context. So can we align complementary strategies, strategies and actions across the city so that uh, we're not fighting our other actions or other strategic, strategic initiatives, we're actually, um, they're all enhancing each other. So I'm just gonna zoom in quickly on some of those. So on that first one, change the rules, policy and regulation. So we'll start by setting a baseline or understanding what a baseline means, both in the 2018 context, but also um, so that policies and benchmarks, uh, policies and, and regulations can actually um, uh, set a reduction requirement in a standardized way. We'll first update our rezoning policy, which is kind of our leading indicator or leading policy, our stretch, our stretch code in a way um, that affects roughly 50% of new construction by floor area. And then um, behind that, or actually, so that's, that's the first area. That's where we um, often are able to set higher requirements than just what is the code minimum in, in Vancouver. And some of the things we're looking at in that are a performance uh, percent reduction requirement. That would be kind of the, the, the biggest piece here and uh, a real first for us and uh, for many, I think, to, to have not just reporting like we do now, but actually a reduction requirement. And we're also looking at possibly other requirements like uh, material specific or uh, sourcing requirements. Um, and the, the exact structure of that uh, we're still working through there, there's a couple different ways of structuring these things, whether they are requirements or options or, or whatever the case may be. That's something we'll work through uh, over the next few months. After the rezoning policy is updated, well, the building bylaw will follow that policy. We try and have that followed by uh, five years, maybe four, maybe six, um, but just trying to give time for the rezoning policy to lead the way and then the code to follow it. And we're also, of course, setting leading targets for city-owned buildings as well. So on all city-owned buildings, we are already enforcing the mandate of uh, exploring 40% uh, reduction in our own buildings and making changes wherever possible uh, to achieve that reduction. In terms of changing the market, removing barriers and providing incentives, uh, we're already looking to remove barriers. For example, we have a report, uh, well, actually in 2020, uh, May 2020, we made changes similar to the province to allow 12 story mass timber construction, for example. And we're also, we have another report going to council uh, very shortly. Um, actually went to council, was referred to public hearing already. And so hopefully in February that will be approved um, that has zoning and development um, allowances for mass timber construction. So um, minor height allowances to allow for say thicker floors that result from mass timber construction some um, perhaps minor form adjustments that might make it easier to build with mass timber. And that was a, that was a first cut, uh, first thing that we could do, trying to remove barriers to low carbon construction. There's always the opportunity to come back, expand that maybe for other types of low carbon construction, um, whatever that may be, 
um, and also to, to change uh, to, to apply to more building types, because in this case, it's just mass timber above seven stories. Um, but there may be an opportunity to expand that in the future. But at first, we just want to get those barriers out of the way that say, currently, you know, you're not allowed to build this way or that make it very difficult to build uh, with low carbon materials. And of course, we also want to go further and incentivize not just remove barriers, but actually incentivize the deep reductions in embodied carbon. Um, so in terms of, oh, there it is. Uh, action number three, change the culture. We need to build capacity and transform the way industry works um, to really make embodied carbon reductions uh, standard, mainstream, well understood. So this includes coordinating and sharing knowledge with other organizations and governments, and also supporting tools, guides, training, knowledge sharing networks, um, so that we can all have the knowledge we need uh, in order to make this vision a reality. Yeah, it appears backwards there. Uh, and of course, the final action change context. So again, aligning this strategy with all the other strategies and actions that the city are taking. So um, for example, um, are there things we can embed directly in the Vancouver plan or in that Vancouver planning process um, that would help create low carbon neighborhoods uh, from the beginning to kind of build it in, um, whatever the case may be there. Um, one other one thing that uh, jumps to mind whether through that process or is actually going to be undertaken as a separate uh, explicit process in the next year is optimizing parking requirements. So as part of big move two, um, the city will actually be removing parking minimums um, from, from buildings. And so that can actually, of course, have some embodied carbon benefits because you no longer need to build, you may no longer need to build as much material as you otherwise would um, if you're required to have a minimum parking with that, all the kind of underground concrete that comes with that. Um, other things include supporting zero emission construction sites. So there's a tie-in with Big Move 3 uh, and Transportation 2040 there, where Big Move 3 is supporting electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging. Is there a way that we can um, expand zero emissions construction sites? Can we get some of that uh, electric construction equipment that's already in use in Europe? Can we get some of that over here? Can we get people trying it out? Things like that could be really exciting. We of course have a zero waste 2040 strategy as well um, and um, some efforts on deconstruction and, and reuse. So are there things that we can do uh, to tie in with that and either in the way we structure our policies, can we give credit for material reuse? Can we um, you know, use the knowledge and the, the all the work that's being done in that space to uh, find those synergies between zero waste material reuse, circular construction economy, all those really interesting emerging areas. Of course, supporting seismic re resilience is really important. We are working on a, a seismic resilience strategy for buildings. Um, and for, of course, in a seismic zone, we have a great deal of work to do to make our buildings safer. Um, and there's a lot of work in the material area there. Um, some, some of the benefits potentially, for example, you know, low carbon materials can be, low carbon buildings can be more modular. They can sometimes be lighter. Um, all of these things can make it easier to resist the forces in a large seismic event or replace components um, if they get damaged. So there's some really interesting tie-ins there. And of course, we want to support that green building economy, um, both in terms of the, the recovery and the COVID recovery, and also the local and regional economy um, so that we are, uh not just reducing our carbon and construction but also enhancing the value and uh, the local value of our construction economy and there's a lot of really exciting ways to do that so the um we also did a modeling exercise as part of developing the strategy and what you see here is we developed actually uh, build out scenarios through to 2050 for new floor area by building type we uh, took a, uh, a, an estimate of the embodied carbon intensity today of buildings, and we modeled a couple different reduction scenarios for different building types. Like if you know a certain building type had a 20% uh, reduction requirement starting in rezoning in 2020 or 2021, 
and then that follows through into code. And then we upped that again in 2025. So we looked at a number of diff uh, three different scenarios in terms of kind of a mild, medium, and stringent. This top line here, uh, the top of the yellow band, that's the the most um, kind of light policy application or stringency that we modeled. And that gets us actually almost all the way to a 40% reduction. And then this yellow band actually represents voluntary adoption. So we're hoping that through knowledge sharing, through incentives, through removing barriers, all those other enabling actions, that more and more uh, projects will actually um, use either some or, or all the measures they can to reduce their embodied carbon beyond just what is would be coming into policy and code. And so um, you can see that the, the the bylaw and the policies, the regulations actually, oops, sorry, almost get us there as it is. And that voluntary adoption on its, on its own can really take us across that 40% line and um, possibly past 50% reductions. So that's partly why those enabling actions are so um, important because the more we have opt-in uh, projects, the more projects are, are kind of taking this on and reducing their embodied carbon, we can actually have a less stringent um, requirement pathway as it, as it evolves. And the, you know, the bottom is the limit um, for or zero is the limit for that, the bottom of that bar. Um, we can actually, it'd be amazing to see projects taking on much deeper reductions earlier, uh, whether we can get incentives to them or not, because they can really help pave the way for um, those deep reductions and that those are future kind of surpassing of the target. In terms of next steps, so uh, very excited that this climate emergency action plan in full was approved at council in November, um, including all the, the big moves two, three, four, and five. And um, so in terms of first steps of implementation, so we'll be developing um, the specifics of an embodied carbon policy. We've been doing a lot of research over the last year or two years actually, about what that could look like. And um, we'll be developing that uh, and consulting on that in Q1, Q2 of next year. Uh, so that will lead to our, an update to the rezoning policy in 2021. And then that update would take effect either late 20, at the end of 2021 or in 2022. So for new rezoning applications coming into uh, the city, that's what they would, that would apply to. Uh, we're also looking to make further code changes to allow mass timber beyond what we've already done last year. We have some research in that area and hoping we might be able to um, uh, remove some further barriers in, in the building code there. We want to, um, we're also in 2021 going to be creating part nine incentives. So it's really important to get those incentives out as a leading indicator, get people working on this, get them excited, get them trying out deep reduction um, measures. And, and part nine is where we have the greatest potential for that. That's where uh, relatively small amounts of money can really uh, change decisions and projects. We're gonna be rolling that out in 2021 as well. And of course, there are many other actions uh, through 21, um, from 2021 through to 2025. And then you know, you'll see in the roadmap uh, that's in the uh, strategy itself, from 2025 onwards, we basically, we take this and we iterate it. So um you know we take what's in that 2020 ideally we take what's in the 2021 rezoning and that goes into code and then we up the bar for the rezoning policy and then again in 2020 2030 we do the same we up the bar again in rezoning we up the bar in code and that's building off the uh, successful approach of the zero emission building plan that we've seen already with operational emissions while of course continuing to pursue all of those enabling actions uh for industry support, for incentives, for removing barriers, all those great things. So just a sneak peek, a sneak peek of uh, what we're working on, some of the kind of initial things that we've heard. Like what is what kind of shape are these 2021 actions taking? So of course we're working on the updates to the green building policies uh, for rezonings. And so um, we've heard and um, found that using a percent reduction requirement sounds like the most promising approach. It's already in use by LEED and ILFI. There's a number of things like um, 
you know, what is the scope of the whole building LCA? What are the uh, tools you're using? All of these things. Um, the uncertainties around those are much easier to work with when we're having, say, a percent reduction requirement compared to just picking a, a carbon intensity number that um, there are a lot of variables going to and many of which are not, I think, fully understood by everybody at this point. So this is a great way to get started. It's how others have gotten started. And um, I think is, is, look, is what we've heard so far is the most promising. Um, there may be a good, good reasons to switch away from that to more absolute metrics as we get further along in the reduction pathways. Um, but that, those are conversations that I know will evolve organically and um, many are interested in having. So look forward to that. Uh, but this is just kind of what we heard so far. And of course, we, as I said, we'll be consulting over the next, say, uh, four to six months as we get into the details of, of what the policy will look like itself. This is just kind of some, some of the things we've heard. Um, so we do know that we need to provide further guidance. Um, there's a number of areas where we can be really specific um, of kind of what's in, what's out, what are the best practices. There are resources that we can reference. Um, we can standardize our submittals, things like that, that um, we can give guidance around how that baseline is created that you're comparing your percent reduction against. All these things, there's lots of ways that we can um, make this as successful and as impactful uh, a policy as possible. Uh, we have said in the strategy that our first reduction requirement will be at least 10%. That doesn't mean that the requirement itself will be a 10% or greater reduction. It just means when we set that requirement after consulting with everyone, we expect that it will, will be at least a 10% reduction, but there could be, it could be greater. It could be 15, it could be 20, it could be options whereby, um, you know, one pathway you do more and another pathway you do less, but with some other good things. You know, there's, there's different ways that we can set up the policy. And I think that'll be really interesting to talk about when we get into those uh, more detailed consultations and we have uh, specific proposals. And as I said, uh, you know, we've been encouraged and I think there's a lot of opportunity to consider other requirements as well, both from an uh, equity, equity and responsible sourcing perspective, and also in terms of um, tackling some of the uh, kind of higher carbon materials and material categories that, um, that we have in buildings today. So there's a number of uh, areas, um, whether it's that, whether it's healthy materials, other good things that can be encouraged or required when, now that we're into this space of uh, looking at the materiality of buildings. In terms of deep reduction incentives, so uh, as I said, we're gonna start with part nine. We're aiming, which is ground-oriented residential, one to three stories, aiming for launch in 2021, um, current direction is to use the buildings, Builders for Climate Action Carbon Calculator. There's already a pre precedent for this uh, in the municipality of Durodurmer, Ontario, and a lot of great work that's gone into this by Builders for Climate Action, by Chris Magwood, and by many others. Um, this would be similar to our Near Zero program, Near Zero.ca program that we already have in place, whereby um, projects can get thousands of dollars to do a study um, for uh, high levels of energy efficiency, such as passive house, or I believe step five. Um, so that's a program that is already running. You can go to nearzero.ca to see what that looks like. Um, it could be similar to that or build off of our um, understanding and success with that, which isn't to say that it, um, we know who could deliver this program or how it'll be structured yet. Um, just saying that we have a precedent locally um, for that in terms of operational emissions and efficiency. When we think about larger buildings, this is something that could take longer. Uh, the part nine is, a, is easier to have as a quick start. Larger buildings are more complex. There's a lot of moving pieces. They, you know, we don't have the money to just kind of offer a monetary incentive. Uh, we do have things potentially like density, like um, other things that uh, larger projects are looking for and that um, people tell us could be useful. And we have a precedent for that in our zero emissions building catalyst policy. Um, one of the challenges right now is it's, uh, it, it's difficult for us to, to give increased floor area for, um, for embodied carbon. That's something where we need to work through. And, um, but there may be other things we could do, or there may be ways we can do that. 
So um, we're gonna we're gonna take a little bit longer, but um, hopefully we can uh, find our way to incentives for large buildings as well. Um, it took some time to get that Z Catalyst policy uh, developed, um, and I think we could review that and see if we might be able to expand on it or um, modify it or or replicate it somehow when it comes to embodied carbon. But that would be a, a good kind of starting place. In terms of capacity building, um, so we want to coordinate with other governments and other organizations. We're already, you know, had some kind of just knowledge sharing with other other governments, especially just had some conversations with the province, giving them an update on this is what we're doing, this is, this is an overview of the strategy, things like that. Um, and I think there's a lot more opportunity for that, uh, for connecting with other local governments that have had questions uh, as well, and um, potentially Metro Vancouver even, who is uh, taking a greater interest in their ability to um, have an impact when it comes to carbon. So if there's anything we can do to share knowledge, to uh, encourage, advocate, align with other initiatives, that's absolutely something we want to do. Because we're just one city at the end of the day, and we really want to be able to multiply our impact as much as possible um, and uh, help others start uh, sooner and, and farther along the curve based on what we've already learned. And of course, we want to support industry and groups like uh, this group here today, um, local organizations like Zebex, which we established um, for this very purpose of, of sharing knowledge within industry, whether it's projects or training or tools, things like that. Uh, we are currently doing uh, a lot of research and modeling and costing work on you know, what options are there to reduce your embodied carbon, especially in larger buildings. That um, we're hoping coming, hoping to come to a conclusion of that work in the next uh, month or two and be able to share that publicly. But one of the um, exciting things about that work is we may be able to create an online tool, or we will be able to create an online tool um, similar to the Pathfinder tool that is already out there for uh, the energy step code and for operational emissions uh, and energy use. We'd like to create a similar tool for Embody so that you can go in and quickly see with a large building, if I you know, change these different factors, there'll be there's sliders that you can kind of move, change between materials or, or whatever the case may be. What impact does that actually have? What are the what are the big moves, and what are the things that um, you know maybe you you'd like to keep on your project, and you can make up for elsewhere? It's been really helpful with the step code, and um, we'd really like to get there, um, a, you know, sometime in 2021 to get that tool up and out into the hands of everybody. And of course, sta standardizing and publishing um, submittals. So we're already working on how can we better standardize. Um, the information when projects are doing their whole building LCA and submitting them to the city, can we create that in uh, submittal in a way that is useful to others so they can see and work with this data um, and also kind of standardize it so that it could be both easier from a workflow perspective and more rich in terms of uh, what we can look at uh, as a city and what others can learn from these projects in terms of how they achieved what they did, what materials they used, all these different things. And so finally, in terms of discussion questions, um, my questions for, for all of you are, you know, what, what does industry need? What do we need? What are the significant opportunities? What are the significant barriers? What tools do we need? What training, what data do we need? Uh, what knowledge sharing do we need? And how can we as a city, um, while we have some resources available, you know, where should we focus our efforts? What would be the most, the, the biggest things that we could do to really help you uh, reduce the embodied carbon of your projects and to understand what, um, what the big impacts are and really build a shared vision and knowledge among us as an embodied carbon community to enable that long-term vision. So I'd like to leave you with these questions. I'm happy to hear any feedback on those. And I'm happy to take any questions on uh, any of that. Um, we have more on our zero emissions building plan at zeroemissionsvancouver.ca slash zero emissions. And of course, if you search um, climate emergency, the, the action plan is there. And you can see the embodied carbon strategy um, at this link here, which is, this will take you to the whole climate emergency action plan council report. 
And if you jump to those pages highlighted, that's the embodied carbon strategy there. And I'm really happy to talk with anyone, hear your ideas, answer your questions through my email here. Um, so with that, happy to have a, a discussion and take any questions. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, that was amazing, and uh, it's it's so amazing to see the city of Vancouver um, do all the work that has been done on the embodied carbon front. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's really great to see the progress that's been made on that front. So yeah, we're gonna open it up to um, questions, discussions. Um, actually, can you maybe switch back to that slide uh, with with those questions that you had just now? And um, I know there's a, a, a yeah, there's there's some questions that have been posted on the chat as well. Um, but let's turn this into more of a conversation. So even if you posted your question onto the chat, I invite you to unmute yourself and just ask the question. And um, yeah, we have, uh, we've purposely scheduled a bit more time. So we have something like another 45 minutes here to, to dive into discussions, conversations. So um, yeah, if, if you have a question, please unmute yourself. And, and I, I should also note that um, this is being recorded um, and we will ultimately be uh, uploading this onto the CLF Vancouver YouTube channel as well, um, including the Q&A part as well. So just in case you're, you have any concerns about being posted, <laughs> yeah, part of that, um, yeah, that, that's just something. Or if you have specific concerns, please let me know. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let's uh, jump in with questions. Anybody want to mute themselves? I can ask the first question. Sure, please. Uh, so thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it's exciting to see the city's impressive goals and strategies for embodied carbon reduction. In a slide 15, you mentioned about uh, the assessment of the uh, existing building stocks embodied carbon content. So I wonder if you could elaborate or if there is uh, some document published elsewhere, uh, you could uh, direct me uh, into, the, on, into that website or uh, that resource. Uh, I'm particularly interested to know how uh, the existing building stocks in body carbon was assessed, what methodology was used, uh, and uh, any other methodological detail. Thank you. Yes, so I should clarify, it wasn't uh, existing. It was an estimate of the carbon intensity of new construction. So we had uh, numbers in terms of kilograms per meter squared. We multiplied those by meter squared, we think will get built very roughly between every year between now and 2050. And that came out with, uh, you know, an overall emissions uh, citywide from carbon, uh, from embodied carbon in a year. Then we applied the reduction scenarios to those. Um, but the numbers, um, our consultant that did that, um, that was the Sustainability Solutions Group. Um, and they had a sub modeling sub consultant. Um, so they looked at a number of different sources. I think they looked at, um, we shared numbers from our rezoning uh submittals that was we have shared on our report vancouver or on our webpage vancouver.ca slash zero emissions did a report where uh we hired uh zara Tashnidi to actually go back through our first year or so of submittals or 18 months of submittals and um that so that has some carbon intensity numbers for projects there i think they looked at the uh, builders for climate action white paper for part nine they looked at a uh, clf benchmark study especially for other building types. So ultimately it was a number of different sources that they looked at to just kind of, and ultimately it's, it's an estimate. Like, you know, you can't measure what these carbon intensities are. We needed to start with an estimate. And the biggest thing was to understand um, how different targets on different building types, whether they would add up to a 40% reduction or not, or what that could look like and what the role of voluntary adoption would look like. Thank you. Hi, Patrick. Uh, Will Nash from WSP here. Um, it's a great initiative and it's great to see Vancouver really taking the lead here. I suppose when we look at taking a carbon intensity, right, obviously the problem is with a city that continues to grow, the total emissions can still be climbing. So I guess rather than using a baseline, we know that ILFI requires offsets of any embodied carbon emissions greater than zero. And so would the city consider taking that approach or alternatively, alternatively, sorry, setting a total carbon budget for planning purposes? Um, 
perhaps in the future. Um, I think it's just there's just so much uncertainty around those absolute numbers right now. Um, for example, the if you look at the CLF benchmarking study, it's I think you know ranges from up from 500 to 1,000 kilograms per meter squared. Our submissions have come in generally between 200 and 500 kilograms per meter squared. But if you include uh, tenant improvements, if you include if you were to include mechanical and electrical equipment, that goes up by I don't know 50 to 150. Um, and honestly, there are weird things that happen that uh, with carbon intensities per meter squared that if you don't understand them well, there are projects that will pass easily just by doing what they were going to do and others could be in a very deep hole to dig themselves out of just by the nature of the shape of their site or the, the form factor and things like that. So um, you could probably set like a, a looser backstop like I think ILFI does a 500 or in one version of their standards, at least 500 kilograms per meter squared. Um, you could probably set a, a high-ish number as just kind of an absolute backstop, um, but it's uh, not a very specific tool or a precise tool to use at this stage, I think, is my understanding. Um, but in terms of offsets, I think that's something we could look at in the future. Um, we want to get started with actual changes to the construction system um as soon as possible and then i think if we were to have you know i can imagine post 2030 if we had like a, a net zero target or if sometime in the future had a net zero target itself um i think you have to start talking about offsets and their role at that point but it would be nice to see you know reduction targets with actual material changes getting to 40 50 percent reductions i think before these um start getting into offsets that would be cool but um you know i think it's something that's really interesting and that we should understand uh, better and have really good conversations about in the future great any other questions uh hey patrick this is Sepper for shari from city of richmond uh, you talked about the need for these different policies and strategies and all to be complementary or at least not contradictory. And so on that note, I was wondering if you can comment on this uh, push to reduce embodied emissions and then the other kind of big push for electrification. And I'm particularly thinking about uh, refrigerants in heat pumps. That's a great question. Um... One other thing that comes to mind from that that ties into the last question is, for example, uh, brick in buildings, right? Like there are some buildings that because of the area they're building in um, or the neighborhood, they may want to have or may be required to have a lot of brick uh, facade and that can affect your kilograms per meter squared as well. So lots of things go into it. Um, and so that's it also brings to mind an area that we may be able to help align um planning policies um, urban design guidelines things like that to, to be a bit more optimal that's one example of the kind of optimization between strategies but when it comes to uh, electrification and heat pumps specifically um, that's another one of those things that can really um, vary by a wide margin is the impact of refrigerants and so we've actually our approach we talk about it a little bit in the strategy but not a lot because we actually want to uh, peel that off and treat it more in the new emissions or the operational emissions side of things. Because it is something that could be, if it's leaking, it's leaking year over year. It ties into the operations and the um, maintenance of buildings and the, um, the kind of uh, electrification of buildings to get to low operating emissions. And so I think there's room for new policies or efforts in that area. Um, for example, uh, the EU and the province of Quebec have limited the global warming potentials of refrigerants in different material or in different uh, equipment types. I think there's potential for the EU is also, they've done a really comprehensive F gas regulation framework where, um, for example, pipes could be uh, tested um, on, on kind of repeating timeframes. We don't even require that the testing of uh, natural gas piping right now, 
Um, but what about the refrigerants as, as well? And um, even a good first step that uh, some have su suggested to us would be just, just the requirement to report leaks of refrigerants. Like right now, a whole building can lose its whole charge, recharge it, lose it again, recharge it again, without ever even alerting any uh, government or environmental agency or, or anything like that. So reporting of leaks, I think, could drive accountability in the industry. Um, that's another way, I think. So there's a number of areas that we could, um, that there could be some really impactful actions when it comes to refrigerants, but I don't think, I feel like keeping them outside the embodied carbon space um, might be the best way to do that. Great, thanks. Um, any other further questions? Yeah, Patrick, this is uh, Dan Crouch from um, Lehigh Hansen. Um, you mentioned in, you know, in your strategy, you talk about in your, in your over, overviewing uh, discussion, you mentioned the transparency and, and looking for more sustainable materials. Have you had much discussion or have, have you have any comment on thinking about how do you actually measure the carbon, uh, embodied carbon in a consistent sort of equitable way from product to product? Uh, I'm thinking environmental product declaration and, 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 so, and so forth. Can you comment on that, please? I can try. It's, uh, it's a very complicated area, as I've learned. And I'm very, we're very lucky to benefit from a lot of smart people working very hard in this space. But um, as, a, as a municipality, even as one, a city that's lucky to have some resources to put into this area, we're, we're going to rely on standards and tools that uh, have vetted these things. And so I'm not sure um, we'll be able to do much more than is already done by the standards uh, and tools that we can reference and um, that others can use. So it may, I think it will fall to the, the tools themselves to accept or not accept EPDs into their, um, into their system that projects can then use. Um, one question I don't yet know is how it works to use, say, a whole building LCA tool and then a more um, EPD specific tool kind of maybe later in the design for procurement, like the amazing EC3 tool, for example. Um, I think that's a, something that some people hopefully understand how to, how to do well and use both. Um, but there's this whole world of standards and product category rules and EPD uh, standards and things like that, that I think we'll have to rely on the expertise of others. We're also lucky, of course, to have the national LCA squared uh, initiative that will hopefully answer some of these questions for us as well. But I think it is exciting. The more we're able to get EPDs, if we're able to encourage the reporting or requesting of EPDs, um, I think you know there's a lot of exciting things that can be done in that space. And I think in a perfect world, uh, in the future, you'd be able to have everyone kind of bringing forward their EPDs and saying, I've got a better product, I've got a better product, pick me, and really drive that market innovation um, around low carbon materials and, and low carbon products. Okay, great, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, we'll keep going with questions, um, but actually, Patrick, could you maybe um, maybe stop sharing your screen so that we could actually just oh, sure. uh, uh, we can see people a bit better. Um, <laughs> the Hoping people caught those questions already. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, please unmute yourself. And if, if you're willing to also uh, show your camera as well when you ask a question, that'd be nice. Um, any other further questions or comments? I have a question. I'm uh, Antje Wall from Forestry Innovation Investment. Um, so Patrick, if you theoretically could write a wish list to the province to support this effort, what might be on that list, if anything? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think I would ask them to look through the strategy and see where, what fits with them, what they can do. Um, I mean, in the long term, uh, it would be amazing to have something like an embodied carbon step code. I think could be really cool. Um, you know, whether that is the right pathway for it or not, I'm, I think 
a lot of people have good ideas, but um, I think a lot of local governments are interested. I think some consistency or the opportunity to get into this space uh, across the province would be amazing, or even just have, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of opportunity at the provincial level. Um, there's also, of course, opportunities to, um, you know, through the Clean BC program, I think if we were able to fold embodied carbon into that, that would be amazing to get incentives out um, province-wide for whether through the Clean BC program or anything else. It, I think it might actually, in some ways, already be folded in there, um, or at least uh, talked about in some ways. So mm -hmm. um, there's opportunities around mass timber and region, local and regional economy. There's opportunities around uh, low carbon concrete and uh, being industry leaders there and all materials, I think. So there's really, there's great opportunities around incentives, around regulation, around um, supporting standards and uh, knowledge sharing and tools and, um, and really interesting kind of economic pieces, I think that uh, the province could do as we look to our uh, sustainable and, um, and uh, building back better kind of uh, COVID recovery as well. Thank you. It's a it's a big list. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but opportunities. That's one of the great things about the embodied carbon space is, I think there's because it's a relatively new. There's a lot of chances to do things um, that we haven't done before and that people are excited about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. Yep. Can I jump in? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm Stephanie Dallow from Dialogue. Um, one of the questions I have, especially around addressing some significant barriers, are the logistics are on a job site, construction site, when it comes to trying to salvage material um, so that it could be uh, reused. How do you think a city of Vancouver could actually make that a more convenient option for, for contractors? That is a great question. Um, I would start by talking to my colleagues uh, who work on the Zero Waste 2040 and deconstruction areas. Um, I know that one of the things we've heard is that uh, if we can just require deconstruction in more homes, just thinking at the part nine level, we've heard loud and clear, the, the stronger regulation is in that area, the more level of a playing field it is and the easier it is then to develop better deconstruction services, which then facilitate, of course, material reuse. Um, we have a, as I understand it, we are looking to create a, a deconstruction hub that will actually help facilitate the kind of storage of those materials and, and resale of those materials. Um, and I think we can create a policies that give credit for material reuse, so creating a demand as well, because uh, that's one of the concerns is that chicken and the egg problem of if we if we do salvage these materials, will anyone buy them? Um, so we can help with that area. Um, I, I don't know quite as well the, the on-site uh, details of how we can encourage or get out of the way of, of different things, but um, I know I have some colleagues working very hard in that space. But happy to hear any other ideas or suggestions as well and pass those along. Great, thanks. Um, Nick, were you wanting to ask a question? Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, hey, Patrick, um, I'm with the Government of Canada and we're reducing our emissions uh, from our own buildings and operations. And uh, so similarly, and sorry, I missed the beginning, so you may mention this, but similarly, we're, we have similar embodied carbon uh, uh, footprint uh, targets. So happy to work with you. To, we've been working together, happy to continue to work together. And just a good sort of indication that a lot of uh, a lot of the country is moving in this direction. And so this is uh, this is where well, the world's going. So uh, great work to date and great to hear uh, an update on where you are. So cheers. More of a comment than a question. So good work and we look forward to working together. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. I appreciate support from the uh, LCA Squared Initiative and also just that it exists and the great work that they're doing there and all the great work at the, the Greening Government team. Amazing. Anyone else? I had one other question, if I may. Uh, you talked about the difficulty of all these different methodologies of LCA and the different tools, and you know you get different results, uh, and also what that means in terms of establishing this 
you know, intensity goal, this, you know, tar absolute target. So, and then I'm thinking about what the city of Vancouver has done in energy. So now I'm wondering if you have considered having uh, prescriptive requirements for different components of either the building or mechanical systems and so on. Let's say, I don't know, that uh, the embodied carbon intensity of your insulation cannot exceed a certain value, and then you have the EPDs to uh, evaluate that. Uh, so on top of or in parallel to that overall building uh, emission targets. Yeah, definitely thinking about material specific things, um, areas that have been had precedent or been raised to us are high carbon insulation materials and spray foams um, and things like uh, the, you know, the amazing low carbon concrete code that Marin County has and that I think a lot of people are hoping to, to copy as quickly as possible um, where we can. That would be amazing. Um, I tend, when I say, I, I've mentioned the words like uh, prescriptive requirements in the past and people have kind of uh, pushed back a little bit, but I think the idea of material specific performance requirements, which is the way the um, low carbon concrete code in Marin County, for example, works. I think people are excited about that. Um, so it just comes down to knowledge like, and, and the options that you want people to have. The more prescriptive is obviously easier, but um, is best applied when um, you can kind of run all the calculations you want, but the, the net result is the same, just do this. Um, that's where they're best suited. Um, where there's lots of different options and you want to maximize flexibility, I think um, that's where performance requirements say they're at the material level or, or the whole building level uh, fit well. But I think if there are opportunities to, to really kind of cut through the complexity and just say, you know, do this or this, I think that would be exciting. And one of the things, um, that's why in the part nine side, uh, where there's less knowledge and less resources to, to do these LTA calculations and things like that, that's where a tool like uh, the Builders for Climate Action um, Carbon Calculator, their beam tool um, helps do that. And I think that's why um, we've been looking at that and other municipalities have looked at that, like. You know, just having a tool that goes with the, the program itself. In the part three world, we're, we're lucky to be able to have more flexibility and open it up to more tools and, and options and things like that. Hi, Patrick. This is Manuela from Perkins and Will. Um, one thing that we've been finding challenging is, like you said, that knowledge sharing and allowing designers to make decisions uh, or to make reductions at the point of decision. A lot of the tools that we see are kind of an after the fact where you download a bill of materials and then see how you're doing. So hopefully in the next few years, we can start moving towards a more interactive and immediate decision-making process. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope something like creating a like a pathfinder like tool um, not even necessarily as a as a compliance tool, tool but just an information tool uh, to get started to get people thinking and understanding you know where are the big what are the relative orders of magnitude of different design decisions I think could be really exciting um, and hopefully that's something we can have uh, out in the next year but I, I hear you yeah it's it's tough and um, the more knowledge we can have in that space the better I mean, I think there's, you know, firms like yourself, um, anything that we can all learn from specific projects I find is, is really helpful. So it's one thing for us to have tools, but for those that are going through it to then be able to present case studies or even just, um, you know, things that they've learned going through the process uh, can be really, I think, helpful to a lot of people at this early stage. Great, thanks. <laughs> Actually, oh yeah, go ahead. Is there somebody else that just unmuted? Yeah, yeah, it's, hey, Anthony and Patrick. Um, this is Jeremy from Integral. So I just had a question and I, I may have missed, I missed, I think a slide due to IT issues um, in the middle. Um, is there an intent or, you know, one of the things that I think we would really find value in and I think other practitioners could probably comment too is uh, kind of a more unified modeling guidelines. 
Um, I don't know if there's been any discussion about that, um, but I know for the energy modeling world, the city of Vancouver's energy modeling guidelines are front and center. So maybe there's another opportunity there in this space. Yeah, that's my hope as well, that we can give a bit more guidance. I know uh, CAJBC, ILFI, they have additional kind of guidance. Um, hopefully we could, um, you know, borrow some of that or build off it or, or whatever works best. Um, yeah, anything we can do to make it easier and clearer and fairer across projects, try to do the same thing. Um, we'll definitely do everything we can. So I have a little kind of offside question. Patrick, I'm Jesse, Jesse Neary. I'm a civil engineer in infrastructure. And the city has a lot of assets that are not on private land, like community centers, city buildings, embedded infrastructure, streets, parks, all that kind of stuff. As uh, this is a city policy, how is the philosophies that are in it going to, how are the philosophies that are in it going to show up in other parts of city work? That's a great question. Um, and so we talk about in the target uh, buildings and construction, which it hints at those other areas as well um, of infrastructure, roads, um, other city buildings, things like that. So uh, we actually have as part of our green operations plan 2.0, which was just uh, relaunched this year, um, embodied carbon targets for city works as well and city buildings. So definitely, yeah, we don't want to miss that. Um, I think in city buildings, it's um, even more ambitious than this target. And in infrastructure, because it's even less well understood, we have the ambitions, but there, there's a bit more flexibility to kind of do what they can, where they can. But even things like just, um, you know, for some projects, I know they've looked at it, they, they've done the LCAs, um, they've looked at things like just switching concrete to asphalt, for example, um, can save uh, a lot of embodied carbon and also can save some money, actually. Um, so there's there's different areas where, um, you know, some basic changes and, and some basic knowledge and just looking at this area can have some positive uh, results. Ah, super. And I am imagine that also applies into recreation and parks. Uh, parks and recreation, um, where it's a city building, um, a new city building, yeah, they, they would definitely apply. Um, haven't talked as much to the parks board, but I think they're, they're part of that uh, green operations planning as well. So um, I think any new kind of publicly owned city building uh, is developed through our facilities group and they have those targets. That's my understanding. Thank you. I think there's a little bit of a follow on there related to capturing carbon and things like soils and parks, but that might be from somewhere else to deal with. Well, that's a good tie in to that. As I mentioned, the, the big move six that looks at uh, negative emissions, restored um, forests and coastal ecosystems and um, and uh, like green space, things like that. So I think that's that's a good uh, tie back to that action as well that will um, they'll have, they're working towards targets for next year and really trying to understand where the opportunities are. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I think Stephanie was just asking about, uh, could you clarify on the asphalt to concrete, uh, comment? Wait. My understanding was that, uh, concrete, uh, showed up as more intensive, um, than asphalt for, as a paving material. I, I, I could have it backwards, but that was um, what I remember from that. Cool. Well, I could probably step into that. That's, it seems logical because when you're dealing with um, with asphalt, you don't have to cook it, cook the materials quite as much as you do in concrete. I think there's more phases of cooking in concrete than there is in asphalt, ironically. Wonderful, thanks. Actually, um, just uh, to build on the point around the infrastructure side, um, Ciela Vancouver, we are thinking about, or we're planning to create some sort of event around infrastructure uh, sometime early next year. So if you know of people or any any recommendations even for speakers or how to frame this discussion, I know it's a relatively new area in the embodied carbon space. So um, if uh, please do reach out to me if, uh, if anybody has leads on that for speaker recommendations or just how to frame this discussion 
um, including you, Patrick, obviously you would. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, oh, and also to build off a previous uh, question, um, uh, Matt Dalkey responded to Jeremy, but um, the NRC, the National Research Council's LCA squared initiative is working on a whole building LCA guideline. Um, it's in the draft stage right now, but uh, folks in Athena are, are working on this right now. So that will be coming up. Okay, any other uh, other questions or comments? Sorry, I just wanted to jump in again, just because I know one of your questions was about data that we would be needing. And I wanted to know if um, you, Patrick and Anthony, have have seen use here in North America of the buildings as material banks, the VAMB. Have you guys heard of that or, or seen it being applied? And I guess how, how the city can help incentivize more people to do that. Definitely heard of it. Um, I think it's a really exciting uh, idea. Um, I, I don't know exactly what we can do right away, but I think it's, um, I think it's really exciting this, this idea that we can have buildings as long term long term stores of value and of materials and, and urban mining of materials. I think it ties in with design for deconstruction. Um, and there's some digital things as well around digitization of construction, uh, maintaining digital twins of buildings. Um, but um, I don't we're not quite there. I haven't seen any North American examples, only um, examples in the Netherlands. Um, I, I talked to an architect that was working on a project there and they were um, they were tagging their or actually uh, like the burning in um, product details and descriptions onto their CLT floor panels so that in the future they would know exactly what the, the wood was and where it came from and composition and things like that so it be, could be best reused. Um, and they were actually putting RFID tags in uh, precast concrete structural materials and, and things as well, um, which was really, it sounded really cool so that you could read that in the future and know what to do with it and how to take it apart and all that stuff. But I haven't seen, I would love to see a North American example, but um, I think we're seeing some interesting developments around just modular construction and uh, pre prefabricated construction. And um, hopefully it can kind of build from there. It would be cool to see here. Perfect, thanks. Any other comments? Maybe while we're waiting, I, actually, I, I do have a question for you, Patrick. Um, the regarding like supporting local groups, you know, like CLF Vancouver. There's there's also many other CLF hubs uh, like all around the world right now, and I, I think a, a lot of them are also thinking about you know what role they can play to help support uh, policies locally as well. So I'm just curious from your standpoint, like. What role do you think a group like us can can play or has played, and also like what can we do to help further support um, any efforts at the kind of local policy level? And it could be specific to Vancouver, but also even just for other municipalities and other like groups that are starting up. Like, what do you think they could do? I mean, uh, for starters, just keep doing what you're doing. It's been absolutely amazing. I think anyone that's participated in in this group has uh, felt really lucky to have it, really lucky to have the opportunity just to talk with their their peers about. Uh, and learn from their peers and find out where they're at, ask questions, listen, because um, it really, it facilitates people at all different levels of, of learning and all different types of knowledge sharing from formal training to um, case studies, to just informal discussions, to even just knowing who to call um, and knowing who's who in the, in the local community. And, uh, and the more intangible support as well of, Hey, I'm really struggling with this. Um, I, at least I know I'm not alone in that. Or I'm really inspired by what some other people are doing. I wonder if I could do that. So I think just keep doing what you're doing. Um, if there's ways that we can support you, that I think that would be really exciting and interesting to us as well. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> I think it's been great, and we're really lucky to have a group like this. Thanks. Um, great. Any other uh, questions or comments? And I know there were also uh, some that were previously posted on the chat as well. So if, uh, if we haven't gotten to those, um, yeah, please do kind of unmute yourself and share. Well, there was there's one related to the uh, life lifetime you had aimed for in the uh, new buildings. I think Anja and Emily had some some questions, but mine was related to 
to how if we're trying to make buildings and designs more adaptive so that uh, we can actually accommodate shifts in our circumstances as through the life cycle of things, either environmental circumstances or use circumstances, if we're aiming for adaptive design, how does that stack up against the, this, this, the, what appears to be a desire for really long building lifetimes? That's a great question, and I don't know. I don't know the answers in that in that space. Um, I was excited to see that there. I think there is a stand, an ISO standard just released on designing for disassembly and um, deconstruction. I, I have looked up the number, but um, things like that could be a start. Um, but um, ideally, I think if you're looking at all the layers of a building and taking into account the replacement life cycles of those different things then there isn't necessarily a conflict there that um, you can design to be adaptable um, and lengthen the life of all of those uh, different layers of the building. But there could be some conflicts that could be really interesting. You know, sometimes more, you know, people have said that some of the more durable materials, um, the harder or more cementitious or materials um, can be more durable and um, how that factors into lifetimes and things like that could be an interesting question that we I think um, we could learn more about. You know, for example, if you're paying a penalty up front for a brick facade, if I don't know, I'm not a, uh, I'm not an envelope specialist, but if that lasts longer, or is a material that is infinitely, you know, reusable, um, easily reusable, uh, how, did, how does that work? You know, are you getting penalized for that? Or or not, or, or what, what's uh, the case there? Um, I think there's interesting questions that I, we don't necessarily know the answers to, but we'll have to work through as best we can. In, in the absence of another question, there's one that relates to that, and that's um, how frequent the, the, the horizon that the plant has is 10, nine years. So are there interim goal, point, goal posts where, where the city will be checking back with industry to, to evaluate the path and progress and, and tweak the path? I think, um, so we'll be reporting on our, we have uh, identified metrics in the climate emergency action plan. We'll be reporting back to council every year on those. The challenge is actually gonna be just, um, it's the, the lag time in construction is so long that um, we have, we had to try and find some leading indicators, uh, that will hopefully start to see a downtick sooner than the kind of seven to 10 year life cycle of planning and building and occupying new buildings. Um, but going beyond 2030, that's where that vision statement is, you know, maybe you could imagine it going up to 2050. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, we actually have to report back and there's a roadmap in the strategy that goes that lays out roughly kind of where we'll what we expect to see or do in different years between now and 2030. So it sounds like you're actually going to be trying to be involved with industry more frequently than typical. Well, definitely. Um, anytime we do any of the actual actions, in order to implement them, we have to go back to council, which means we have to consult with industry and, and stakeholders before we do that. So we'll definitely be checking back on every step of the way. Thank you. I think there's uh, somebody that unmuted. Was it Adam or somebody was about to ask a question? No? Nope. Any other further questions? All right. Well, actually, I, I, I do have another question that just came to my mind. Um, Patrick, you mentioned for the rezoning requirement, you met, uh, you said, you know, at least 10% is what you guys are looking at and looking at potentially, you know, uh, you know, maybe for certain archetypes or uh, certain instances, you might potentially go higher. Um, but what, what um, I guess, what's the pathway between now and like making that decision? Like, are you planning to consult with the group or, or yeah. And when do you think that, that decision is going to like, how are you going to arrive at that decision, and, and uh, do you have a time frame for, yeah, when you think that might, you might yeah. come to a resolution? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. So, as I mentioned, we have a, a study underway right now of, you know, what are the what op design options are available to you, and what do they cost, and what are the some of the you know, maybe buildability concerns or things like that. So, um, generally, we'd like to 
get a first cut of that study done, um, hopefully in January, use the results of that to go out to stakeholders and just initially just double check, like, are these results, are some of these options and results costs, do they generally um, align with your experience? Do they make sense? Do you have any big questions about this? So then we have a common understanding, we're all working with the same numbers um, and a common understanding of like what we're even talking about if we say a 10 or a 20% reduction. Then we can um, put that into a draft policy framework. We would circulate that to all stakeholders. We might do uh, hold open houses or town halls or um, uh, virtual in this case, might come back to a group like this and present, gather feedback, um, we'd set a deadline for that, um, could even do another round of feedback after that if there were significant revisions. Our goal is to get that all into a finalized policy, into a council report, uh, and to council um, by June. Um, that could slip if it needs to, but uh, if there's, you know, we don't want to bring something to council that um, that doesn't have good support. Um, we like we we can, but it's it's ideal to have everyone involved saying we love this, this is great, please do this. Um, and I think there are ways that we can get there. That's generally what that process has looked like in the past, and what we're thinking about over the next six months. That's great. Thanks for illuminating on that. Um, one last call for final questions and then we'll wrap it up. Any other further questions? I would just throw out that that is a little contingent on getting that that research uh, wrapped up so we have that kind of common understanding. For sure, totally. Any final comments? All right, well, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, that, was, that was a marathon of a Q&A period as well. So I appreciate you answering all the questions and thanks everyone for uh, all the questions that you, you posed to the group. Um, yeah, and stay tuned for future events uh, in the new year. And uh, thanks everyone. We'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you.